the existence of this highly condensed state. All this is rather speculative, but it is very likely that the universe evolved from a highly condensed state, and it is even more likely that such a highly condensed state represents the earliest time about which there will ever be any scientific information. Some people are inclined to refer to the highly condensed state as the beginning of the universe. This phrase means no more than the earliest time about which there is ever likely to be any scientific information. But we can conclude that certain of the model universes derived from relativity theory and predicting expansion from a highly condensed state are readily reconciled with the astronomical data. Let us now try to draw a distinction between our mere conventions and fundamental natural laws. It is difficult to distinguish disputes about words from disputes about facts. It oughtn't to be difficult, but in practice it is. In the 17th century there was a terrific debate as to what force is. To us now it was obviously a debate as to how the word force should be defined. But at the time, it was thought to be much more. One of the purposes of the method of tensors used in the mathematics of relativity is to eliminate what is purely verbal in physical laws. We want to express physical laws in such a way that it shall be obvious when we are expressing the same law by reference to two different systems of coordinates, so that we shall not be misled into supposing we have different laws when we actually have only one law in different words. This may be accomplished by the method of tensors. But the problem of arriving at genuine laws of nature is not to be solved by the method of tensors alone. A good deal of careful thought is wanted in addition. Some of this has been done. Much remains to be done. To take a simple illustration, suppose, as in the hypothesis of the Lorentz contraction, that lengths in one direction are shorter than in another. Let us assume that a metre rule pointing north is only half as long as the same metre rule pointing east, and that this is equally true of all other bodies. Does such a hypothesis have any meaning? If you have a fishing rod five metres long when it is pointing west, and you then turn it to the north, it will still measure five metres, because your rule would have shrunk too. It won't look any shorter, because your eye would have been affected in the same way. If you were to find out the change, it cannot be by ordinary measurement. It must be by some such method as the Michelson-Morley experiment, in which the velocity of light is used to measure lengths. Then you still have to decide whether it is simpler to suppose a change of length or a change in the velocity of light. You can adjust your measures to such a fact in various ways. In any way you choose to adopt there will be an element of convention. A more important example is the question of the size of the electron. We find experimentally that all electrons are the same size. How far is this a genuine fact, ascertained by experiment, and how far is it a result of our conventions of measurement? We have here two different comparisons to make. First, in regard to one electron at different times, Secondly, in regard to two electrons at the same time. We can then arrive at the comparison of two electrons at different times by combining the two. We may dismiss any hypothesis which would affect all electrons equally. For example, it would be useless to suppose that in one region of space-time they were all larger than in another. Such a change would affect our measuring appliances just as much as the things measured and would therefore produce no discoverable phenomena. This is as much as to say that it will be no change at all. But the fact that two electrons have the same mass, for instance, cannot be regarded as purely conventional. Eddington described the process concerned in the more advanced portions of the theory of relativity as world-building. The structure to be built is the physical world as we know it. The economical architect tries to construct it with the smallest possible amount of material. This is a question for logic and mathematics. The greater our technical skill in these two subjects, 
the more real building we shall do, and the less we shall be content with mere heaps of stones. But before we can use in our building the stones that nature provides, we have to hew them into the right shapes. This is all part of the process of building. In order that this may be possible, the raw material must have some structure. But almost any structure will do. By successive mathematical refinements, we whittle away our initial requirements until they amount to very little. Given this necessary minimum of structure in the raw material, we find that we can construct from it a mathematical expression which will have the properties that are needed for describing the world we perceive. In particular, the properties of conservation, which are characteristic of momentum and energy, or mass. Our raw material consisted merely of events. But when we find that we can build out of it something which, as measured, will seem to be never created or destroyed, it is not surprising that we should come to believe in bodies. These are really mere mathematical constructions out of events. But owing to their permanence, they are practically important. And our senses are adapted for noticing them rather than the crude continuum of events which is theoretically more fundamental. From this point of view, it is astonishing how little of the real world is revealed by modern physical science. Our knowledge is limited, not only by the conventional element, but also by the selectiveness of our perceptual apparatus. So, you may ask, what is left of physics? What do we really know about the world of matter? Here we may distinguish three departments of physics. There is first, what is included within the theory of relativity, generalized as widely as possible. Next, there are laws which cannot be brought within the scope of relativity. Thirdly, there is what may be called geography. The theory of relativity, apart from convention, tells us that the events in the universe have a four-dimensional order, and that between any two events, which are near together in this order, there is a relation called interval, which is capable of being measured, if suitable precautions are taken. It tells us also that absolute motions, absolute space, and absolute time cannot have any physical significance. Laws of physics involving these concepts are not acceptable. Beyond this, there is little in the theory of relativity that can be regarded as physical laws. The part of physics which cannot at present be brought within the scope of relativity is large and important. There is nothing in relativity to show why there should be electrons and protons. Relativity cannot give any reason why matter should exist in little lumps. This is the province of the quantum theory, which accounts for many of the properties of matter on the small scale. The quantum theory has been made consistent with the special theory of relativity. But hitherto, all attempts to perform a synthesis of quantum theory and general relativity have been unsuccessful. Gravitation need no longer be regarded as due to the effect of the sun on a planet, but may be thought of as expressing the characteristics of the region in which the planet happens to be. These characteristics are supposed to alter gradually, not by sudden jumps, as one moves from one part of space-time to another. The effects of electromagnetism may be regarded in a similar way, but as soon as electromagnetism is made to accord with the quantum theory, its character changes entirely. The continuous aspect disappears and is replaced by the discontinuous behavior which we have already seen is typical of quantum theory. However, if we try to apply to gravitation these ideas of quantum theory, we find...